Good morning. Welcome to this ongoing online course on understanding and reducing greenhouse gas emissions focus on scope 1 and 2 emission reduction through building design and construction. This is week 3 of this ongoing course and first lecture of this third week where we are going to understand what the GHG protocol which is actually driving this entire discussion and you know defining what scope 1, 2 and 3 is. So, this is what we are going to look at in as an overview. I am your instructor Professor Avlokita Agrawal. I am an associate professor in Department of Architecture and Planning at IIT Roorkee. So, before we move forward in this week and I start with discussing the GHG protocol, let us quickly see what all we have covered so far. So, we have actually covered the entire historical evolution of this entire idea of sustainable development and then gradually moving to climate change and then realizing that why what is the most important contributor to this climate change and then there we realize that burning of fossil fuels the conventional fuels is the primary cause and hence the greenhouse gas emissions is what we are coming to. So, we looked at the uh, the related concepts to carbon emissions, carbon footprints and we very broadly looked at what all goes into when we have to calculate the carbon footprint uh, for, for any activity for any product. So, this is what broadly we have seen. Evolving further from there the carbon footprint calculation, we are moving in this lecture today, we are introducing the principles and uh, history of greenhouse gas protocol and we will overview as an overview look at the GAG accounting standards. So, let us begin with the introduction and the principles of GAG protocol. So, GAG protocol and we will look at a very brief history because uh, we were we talked till Paris agreement 2015 GAG protocol had already come into existence by that time, but it was after Paris agreement that the activities gained momentum and the whole protocol which had already been prepared actually came to light and it was continuously being used and it is in use more and more. So, that is what we are seeing there. So, GHG protocol actually emerged on the basis of a report which identified an action agenda to address climate change and that required standardization of GHG emissions. So, we have broadly discussed okay, what is GHG emission or uh, you know the world came together to agree on this that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have to reduce the carbon footprint, but how do we do it? How do we measure it? I may say as a, as a company, as, an, as a manufacturing uh, industry, I may say that I have reduced my GHG emissions by so and so percent. How would these numbers be verified? How would we rely on the numbers that each individual company is giving? So, there have to be certain standardization of measurement, standardization of the procedure and that is where the need for a protocol arose and GHG protocol came into existence. So, what does it provide? It basically provides accounting and reporting standards. So, now what we have agreed so far? by this point is that we have to reduce GHG emissions. Okay. Now, this is established everybody knows that we have to reduce, we want to reduce one we have to know how to reduce it and we also have to know that how much have we reduced quantification is necessary. So, this is what this particular protocol provides us accounting and also reporting because if we have to reduce it. Now, what makes me to actually reduce the emissions. There has to be certain reporting mechanism, there has to be certain measurement mechanism and also some sort of framework which is binding for everybody to reduce. Today, we do not have a binding mechanism or, or a framework which asks companies or the world to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by certain percentage, but voluntarily as part of Paris agreement which we have already seen countries, states, the parties they are already agreeing to becoming net zero or reducing their emissions by certain percentage. So, to fulfill this uh, target which the countries, the parties have set for themselves, we have to measure 
the emissions that have been reduced. So, India has committed that by 2070, India wants to become a net zero emission country. Now, if India has to become a net zero emission country and India proclaims by 2050 itself that we have become a net zero country, who and why should somebody believe that yes, India has done this. So, this is what we require, we require a reporting standard also that how do you calculate and how do you report. This is what greenhouse gas protocol GHGP provides us. It also provides us the globalized standardized frameworks to measure and also manage the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So, it is not just measuring and reporting, it is also managing the greenhouse gas emissions and we will see what all will come as part of the, the protocol because we are wanting to reduce emissions and not just reduce, but also measure them and report them and overall manage the GHG emissions. So, the fundamental aim remains the same that we have to reduce emissions, but how do we do it systematically in a very standardized manner is what this protocol is providing us. So, why? Because we clearly understand that there is a need to reduce emissions and just as I mentioned, we also need to have a standard method to report and measure them. So, in 1998, WRI actually published a report which was called Safe Climate and Sound Business. This was this particular report is considered as a parent report or the origin of what later came to be known as GHG protocol. So, this particular report was actually prepared by WRI, it was published by WRI with the help of large corporate partners such as BP and General Motors that was in 1998. Now, this particular report it identified the action agenda to address climate change that included the need to standardize the measurement for GHG emissions. It was in this particular report that it was realized that certain businesses might already be doing very good and certain others, many others might be needed to be motivated to reduce their emissions. But how do they reduce? What do they need to do? How will they report? How much have they reduced? All of that required, it was felt that they required a standardized measurement and that is how the GHG protocol, the need for it was felt and it came into existence. Now, quickly going over the principles of GHG protocol. So, uh, basically how the accounting and reporting shall be done to make it standardized and make it uniform across. So, there are five distinct principles. First is relevance. So, we have to ensure that the GAG inventory, we will come to GAG inventory, but basically it is the inventory of different types of emissions, different types of activities and related emissions that are there. So, what all is going to be included in that? For example, if we look at the world, the inventories are limited, the businesses may be many, but the set of inventories would change, but individually if you look at inventories, they will remain the same. For example, I am a corporate company, I am an IT company for example. So, what uh, I will have? I will have offices, I will have uh, data centers, I will have servers, I will have uh, people who will be commuting, I will have fleets of transportation to bring my people into the uh, campus, I will have buildings in which people will be sitting and operating. Now, if we look at the individual resources, individual activities that are going into this bigger company, which for example, I have taken here as IT company. So, I have buildings where people will be sitting. So, there could be offices, data centers or everything, but they are buildings. That is one kind of uh, activity, one kind of product which is within this, this entire system it will have its own inventory. Then I might be talking about the transportation, which will have its own inventory. So, these are different activities, different services or resources, each of these. So, IT, so many resources put together, but each one will have its own inventory. So, here when we are talking about relevance, we are actually ensuring that the inventory that we are using, it appropriately reflects the GAG emissions of the company. And then it serves the decision making need of the users both internal and external to, to the company. So, how, when we will, when will we be able to measure the greenhouse gas emissions correctly? When we have the right inventories identified and in place. So, we can generic, generic inventories can be made and the GHG protocol provides 
several such inventories, hundreds of inventories are available, they have been developed over years as part of GHG protocol, but which ones are relevant to the industry, which one are, ones are relevant to the company has to be identified, that is the first principle and very, very important. The other is completeness. So, we have to account for and report on all GHG emission uh, sources and activities. So, the second principle is completeness. We have to account for and report on all GHG emission sources and activities within the chosen inventory boundary. So, first we have selected the inventories and within that we have to talk about completeness. Now, for example, as I said there is for example, transportation that we have taken. Now, transportation or any other activity for that matter, one is that it is operating. It is you know every day so many number of trips are uh, being made, so many people uh, get inside the, uh, the bus or whatever uh, transportation facility we have been uh, uh, we have provided. So, that is one part of it. Now, the second part will be what kind of fuel is going in. So, it could be an electric bus, it could be a CNG based bus, it could be an LPG based uh, vehicle or it could be petrol or diesel whatever. So, there is a variation in terms of fuel. So, one is how many trips, what distances, this is one thing, the other could be fuel, the other thing could be the efficiency of the, of the vehicle that we are talking about. There could be a lot of other factors which will actually make the GAG accounting for how much time when we are operating it, how much time is the bus stopping, is it continuously on, air conditioning on or not or things like that. A lot of these things have literally everything has to be included as part of the inventory to make it complete. If I am talking about say buildings, so what all am I considering inside the building? For example, if I have a diesel generator set, a lot of Indian cities have this uh, issue of power cut. So, to manage that the companies often have their own uh, DG sets or if not DG it is being uh, replaced now, we have uh, the generator sets. Now, when we are actually calculating how much of energy did the building consume, operational energy did the building consume, often we tend to forget that there was a part of the energy which was actually supplied by the, by the generator set. Now, when we are accounting because the metering of this generator set is not going to the to the meter which is actually billed, it is a separate meter, a lot of times we might be forgetting to include this DG set into this. So, this is not making the inventory complete, while we might be thinking ok, I have considered everything within this building envelope, the materials, the, the energy consumption that is going in and a lot of things, but a small thing like this which might eventually have a huge impact is left out. This is what we are talking about as completeness that the inventory, so all the sources, emission sources and activities within the chosen inventory boundary, they have to be included, they have to be complete. Only then will we be really reporting the correct GHG emissions. So, this is completeness, then we are talking about consistency. So, we have to use consistent methodologies to allow for meaningful comparisons of emissions over time and this is what uh, GHG protocol ensures that there is a parity in terms of methodology. Somebody calculates it this way, somebody calculates it the other way and then we will not be able to make the comparisons that who is doing better as far as GHG emissions are concerned and also over time the same company 10 years back I calculated my GHG emissions using certain other methodologies, 10 years later I use certain different methodologies and then I try to compare that is not a comparable data set. So, this is what we are talking about consistency that we have to use the methodologies which are consistent, uh, consistent over, over time and over similar activity elsewhere. There will be differences in terms of geography, in terms of context, but in general similar inventories should use similar methodologies is what we are talking about here and then transparently the document, so we have to transparently document any changes to the data inventory boundary, methods or any other relevant factor in the time series. So, we using the same methodology, but if there are any changes in the inventory itself, then we have to transparently document those changes whether they result in higher emissions or lower emissions, they have to be transparently documented and reported.
And that brings us to the fourth principle which is the most important principle and that is about transparency. So in a bid often you know we might come across intents where in a bid to reduce greenhouse gas emissions though it is still non-binding but the companies are trying hard they are working hard to reduce their GHG emissions. Now when they are wanting to reduce their GHG emissions there could be certain scenario where the company is actually wanting to have lesser number reported. Now in that case we really have to work towards reducing the emissions and not just omit certain activities from the calculation and have some wrong numbers reported or maybe the uh, uh, other way around it could also be higher number reported for some reason. So we have to actually be transparent in documenting all the boundaries, all the inventories, activities that are emitting. GHG for that particular company. So, we have to address all relevant issues in a factual and coherent manner based on a clear audit trail. How do we do that? That is what the protocol is providing us. So, transparency of course has to be ensured from the company's end, but the GHG protocol provides us a framework to be transparent, to transparently document all the emissions that are emerging from the the activities. And then the last principle which is that of accuracy. So we have to ensure that the quantification of GAG emissions it is systematically neither over nor under the actual emissions. So and as far as can be judged and that uncertainties are reduced as far as practicable. So there will be uncertainties there is no doubt about that. It is for any company to be operating there are thousands of activities which are taking place day in and out. So sometimes there could be certain activities or certain specific uh, points which might be omitted or which are too insignificant to be included but we have to be we have to reduce the uncertainties as far as possible is what we are talking about. And we have to achieve sufficient accuracy to enable users to make decisions with reasonable accuracy, accuracy and assurance as to the integrity of the reported information. Because why we are reporting this GAG emission is not for somebody else or to show to somebody, it is for the company itself that what are the activities which are actually emitting more GAG and how can we reduce it. So first thing is knowing where the emissions are happening and then also knowing as a second step how to reduce those emissions. So we can only reduce the emissions once we know that which are the emitting activities, which are the more emitting activities. So these are the five principles of GAG protocol on the basis of which the entire protocol has been uh, designed. Now very briefly I am going to run you through the history. In 1990 there was a requirement for international standard of GAG emission. It was it was realized and in 1998 as I said this report by WRI named safe climate and sound business was published and it was supported by bigger corporates such as BP and General Motors and that made the that kind of provided the base work for the first edition of corporate standard of GAG protocol that was in 2001. At that time it was known as corporate standard and gradually that got elaborated and uh, which is what we know as GAG protocol today and in 2015 almost 15 years later you Paris agreement was signed created under the UNFCCC which is what we have seen. So this is how the, uh, the these are the important events which have led to the development of GAG protocol and the final version of the GAG protocol is it is, it is still ev evolving more and more inventories are being added more and more businesses are being uh, you know. Uh, kind of covered under the protocol. If we look at certain other similar uh, activities and similar organizations which have been created based upon the GHG protocol. So uh, in 1988 of course we know that IPCC was created. In 1997, 1998 was uh, uh, when the, the report was created by WRI. Around the same time not very known and not very established GHG protocol was created but it did not it was not elaborate and it did not have so many inventories and other things but as a name uh, it was created after that based upon the GHG protocol and the 1998 report in 2000 
carbon disclosure project was also founded. CDP does similar things just as GAG protocol does. So, these are all GAG accounting uh, methodologies. And then ISO was formed in 2006 and we will go to understand in the second lecture of this week, we will understand what international organizations for standardization ISO and the protocol and the standard which is relevant to GHG protocol. This particular standard also draws from the GHG protocol largely. This is 14064, it has three parts which is what we will uh, look at in detail in the second lecture of this week. And then there was this another initiative which was called science based targets uh, initiative as BTI. This was launched again it does similar things just as CDP and GHG does. And 2015 we know Paris uh, climate agreement it came into uh, force. And then we also had a TCFD task force for climate related disclosures again this is a climate related disclosure, disclosure and largely talking about emissions but all these for example science based, uh, based targets. So, it is not just emission target, but it is also water targets and other targets which have been included. But in GHG protocol, we are only talking about GHG emissions largely. And then in 2019, there was a partnership for carbon accounting financials that became a global initiative. So, these are largely the ones which are talking about the accounting of carbon emissions plus other emissions may be certain uh, for example, SBTI but largely they are talking about carbon emissions, the GHG emissions. Now coming to GHG accounting standards within GHG protocol. So, within GHG protocol we have these 7 standards for different purposes for different user groups, for different entities. So, we have a corporate standard which was also the first one to be established. So, we have the uh, corporate standard which enables corporate accounting and reporting for corporates. Then we have GHG protocol for cities where this is the protocol for community scale greenhouse gas emission inventories. So, the cities will have several corporates under the uh, umbrella and it will have many other infrastructure related uh, activities and projects uh, going on. So, this is for cities. Then we have mitigation goal standard which is actually driving it is providing the guidance for designing national and sub national mitigation goals and a standardized approach for assessing and reporting progress towards goal achievement. So, this is largely at a national and sub national level that it helps in uh, defining in formulating the mitigation goals and also provides the standardized approach. Then we have corporate value chain which is largely dealing with the scope 3 and we will come to what scope 1, 2, 3 is in the subsequent lectures of this week, but it largely looks at the scope 3 emissions through the entire value chain. So, it is not the direct emissions which are uh, seen from the uh, from the assets that are being owned by the company, but it is through the entire value chain from where the uh, raw material is being procured and how the delivery is happening to the end user through that entire value chain we are looking at the emissions which actually go in the scope 3 emissions. So, this is corporate value ch chain standard. Then we are looking at policy and action standard, it helps in it provides a standardized approach for formulating the policy for reducing GHG emissions. So, uh, the, the governments, different governments, different uh, companies, they have to formulate policies to achieve the targets of reducing GHG emissions. So, this particular uh, standard, it helps them and provides them with a standardized framework on how to define, how to formulate the policies. Product standard, it can be used to understand the full life cycle emissions of a product and focus on the greatest GHG reduction opportunities. So, there are different products and they have different activities which have to be uh, undertaken for manufacturing this particular project product, which are the activities which require this specific focus if we want to reduce the GHG emission is what this particular standard deals with. And the last one is project protocol. So, this is a protocol for project accounting and it is one of the most comprehensive policy neutral accounting tool for quantifying the greenhouse gas benefits of climate change mitigation projects. So, today world over specific projects are being undertaken which are addressing directly which are helping mitigate climate change or helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, it is not that as part of my day to day activity whatever activity I will be doing, I will be doing it so that it has lesser GHG emissions 
or carbon footprint. We are talking about specifically activities which will be mitigating climate change. The purpose of the project is to mitigate climate change. This is what is handled uh, in this uh, project protocol. So, these are the 7 standards which are covered as part of GAG protocol. We will quickly go through, through each one of these and one thing which I would like to emphasize here is what is not covered in this particular protocol and what is covered. So, the first one as we said is corporate standard, corporate accounting and reporting standard. This is a kind of guide for businesses and organizations who are disclosing emissions. So, as I said disclosing emissions, reporting emissions is not a binding thing, but more and more corporates and businesses are coming forward to report their uh, emissions. So, this particular uh, standard it the objectives are to improve transparency and cohesion which we have seen which are the general uh, objectives of GHG protocol, but it helps businesses to prepare an accurate and unbiased GHG inventory by using a standardized methodology and overall bring down the costs for creating GHG inventories by providing standardized uh, requirement. So, it is usually used by businesses and other entities that create emissions. For example, even the universities, the academic setups that we are in, they are also the entities that can be using this corporate standard. So, we are not corporates, academic uh, institutions are not corporates, but they can also use uh, these standards. This particular standard is not helping us quantify the reductions for the GAG mitigation projects. So, what we are doing as I just mentioned, it is only helping us in knowing recording, reporting, measuring the emissions that are taking place. So, today if I have to measure the uh, or I have to report the GAG emissions of IIT Roorkee as a business entity or as a corporate entity let us consider. So, all it will help is in reporting, measuring, quantifying and reporting and what do I have to do uh, for uh, doing that? Of course, I will have to start from identifying the activities which are emitting and then you know knowing the inventories for that, putting all the inventories together. So, we will come to this particular part as well when we start with scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions that how do we do it. So, where the emissions are happening, how do we calculate them, how do we report them. So, all that mechanism we will come to later. But this particular standard does not help us in quantifying reductions for GHG mitigation projects. It is not for that, it is for regular businesses. Then we have GHG protocol for cities. So, objectives are pretty much the same just that this is for cities and the inventories when we are talking about cities, the inventories are going to be many, many and there are because there are several businesses, each business will have its own reporting, but then when we are talking about cities, we will have the infrastructure projects. So, we are actually talking about the infrastructure, the services that the city is providing that the city has direct control over. So, this is the, uh, the scope within which this particular uh, protocol works and again it is not to be used for removals of emissions accounting in agriculture, forestry and other land use. So, we are talking about all the infrastructure and everything that is part of the city, but we are not using it to account for the removals that are happening on account of forests that are going to be there. So, we are excluding these land uses especially agriculture and forestry and other land use where removals are happening as part of the GAG protocol for cities. Then we have mitigation goal standard. This is helping the national and subnational governments for creating, measuring and disclosing emission reduction targets. So, when we say that India wants to become, India aims at becoming net zero emission country by 2070, how will it do that or how will it report that? It is through mitigation goal standard that it will measure and it will disclose that this is the emissions these are the emissions that I have been producing. So, total if I if we say that India wants to become net zero emission through this goal it will clearly mention that this is how I am 
becoming I am reaching the uh, target. Now, when we are using this particular standard, we are comparing disclosures. So, from one country to the other country and there we have to be very, very careful of the methodologies that have gone into accounting. So, how the accounting has been done? A country is not a small entity, it is a very large country, uh, it is a very large entity and there are several cities, states, so many businesses, so much of infrastructure that is going in and here we will also be talking about the policies and policy implementation. What policies have the nations formulated and how those policies have been adopted by different businesses down the line and how together they have resulted in the reduction of emissions. And here we will also be talking about the different emission reduction projects that are coming within the purview of the nation. Because the moment we see that we are achieving or we are targeting say net zero emission, we are looking at the greenhouse gas emissions that are being made and we are also looking at how they are being absorbed, they are being removed, they are being sequestered from the environment. So, this is this is overall the nation's accounting. So, this is what is mitigation goal standard. Then as I said policy and action standard is a guide for policy makers and other decision makers to measure how policies and actions influence GHG emissions. So, we have to see what all policy provisions are being made by the country and just the previous standard which was for mitigation goal for countries, national and subnational governments. There I mentioned that how the policies are eventually going to affect reducing or the GAG emissions. This particular standard actually talks about how a policy will eventually impact the uh, emissions. For example, if uh, a country promotes the use of electric vehicles and maybe there is a policy where the subsidy is introduced on electric vehicles that okay, there will be a 30 percent subsidy on electric vehicles. Now, this is a policy that whoever purchases electric uh, vehicle, the government is going to pay a subsidy of 30 percent. What is going to be the impact of this policy on GHG emissions? How do we calculate that? How the uptake of this policy is uh, how the uptake of purchase of electric vehicle is going to be impacted by this policy is what we have to calculate. What number is likely to be sold, what how much would be the tentative usage and how all this together and how much of the uh, conventional fuel uh, driven vehicles are going to be replaced by the electric vehicles. All this together is the impact of one single policy which is that there will be a subsidy on electric vehicles and what this particular policy as an impact has on greenhouse gas emissions is what this standard helps us to calculate policy and action standard. Next we have corporate value chain scope 3 standard and this gives guidance for evaluating the indirect emissions along an organization's value chain. For example, I am an I am a developer buildings uh, developer. So, we construct. So, for example, I am a developer, we construct buildings. Now, if I say that the buildings that I am constructing, which is actually the end product of this particular company. So, the, uh, we are not talking about the corporate office of this developer house, which I own, but I am also talking about the end product, which is the building and the kind of materials that go in. So, if I am using uh, AAC block or I am using burnt clay bricks or I am using CSEBs. What materials am I using and how those materials are being procured? So, maybe that I am using a burnt clay brick, but how that burnt clay brick is being manufactured? Am I going with conventional method of baking the uh, clay brick or I am taking the brick from a kiln which is uh, extremely efficient? So, there the entire value chain from where the soil is being procured, is it following the environmental standards, it is, is it uh, you know using the efficient uh, systems and equipment, that entire value chain uh, and the emissions through that entire value chain is what this particular standard deals with. Now, here again it should not be used for quantifying avoided 
uh, emissions or reductions as a result of offsetting. Okay. So, we are not talking about this, this is going to be covered in the another standard which is the project protocol. And again it is not to not for making comparisons of scope 3 emissions between the organizations. This is only for the reporting of one particular uh, organization that we are using the standard for. So, the next one is product life cycle standard where we are talking about the life cycle of the entire product that is being delivered. So, as a final product for example, for this particular developer house which we were just talking about if the building is the final product what is the product life cycle emissions is what we are going to cover in this particular standard. Then we have a project protocol. So, we were talking about product earlier and here we are talking about project protocol for measuring GHG emissions reductions from GHG mitigation projects. So, especially the GHG mitigation projects for example, for example, India in a bid to become net zero undertakes huge afforestation exercises. Now, we might be thinking that afforestation is simply uh, you know just uh, absorbing the emissions, the sequestering the emissions, but it is not just that when we are developing the forest at that time certain emissions might also be might also be released the plants are being transferred for an year or three years they will be watered and there will be water provision made to that area. So, all that could be included or might be resulting in emissions. I am just giving you some uh, broad examples, but from any such mitigation project GHG mitigation project the emissions that would be resulting or we will be reducing all of that will be covered as part of the project protocol. Now, there are other standards which we had talked initially also which are similar to the use of greenhouse gas protocol which help us in accounting GHG accounting. So, we have as I had clearly mentioned we have the CDP carbon disclosure project which recommends reporting organizations to use the uh, GHGP when responding to disclosure uh, requests. Then we also have which we have talked about the science based target initiative SBTI and it require companies to follow the GHGP's corporate standards. So, these are the uh, organizations and initiatives which are actually based on uh, greenhouse gas protocol criteria and they are helping in uh, accounting of GHG emissions, but the criteria the protocols and standards remain largely that uh, provided in greenhouse gas protocol. Then ISO 14064, so ISO also is kind of complementary to the GHG protocols corporate standard. So, this is uh, uh, these two kind of go together. Then there is another one uh, environmental protection agencies US EPA center for corporate climate leaderships guidance and that also aligns with GHGP. There is another global reporting initiative GRI and it is based on the requirements of the corporate standard and corporate value chain standard. So, it is largely covering scope 1, 2 and 3 all the scopes for corporates. So, GRI is looking only at corporates. So, there are so many of these standards and initiatives across the world these are accounting methods which are basing their works their accounting strategies on the GHG protocol. Now, this is the last slide of today's lecture. We are not going to discuss scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions which are given in GHGP. We will be discussing them separately from third lecture onwards of this week, but we are largely talking about scope 1, scope 2 and scope 3 emissions. We will discuss in detail, but very broadly if you have to understand, you have to understand that scope 1 emissions are the direct greenhouse gas emissions that are occurring from the sources that are controlled or owned by an organizations. organization. For example, when I am talking about the bus fleet. So, the emissions that are happening because of the transportation fleet that we are talking about is a direct emission. So, this is the direct emission that we are talking about. Scope 2 emissions are the indirect emissions that are associated with the purchase of electricity or fuel or heating or cooling in the assets which are owned by the company. So, for example, as an IT company which I was giving example of they have a huge office 
and the electricity that is going to be supplied in this that particular building. So, there is no direct emission on the site itself because electricity here for the IT company is a clean fuel, but where the electricity is going to be produced and how that electricity is getting produced the emissions that are happening there are the indirect emissions which will be accounted to the build to the building to the to the company. So, reducing the energy consumption itself will result in scope 2 emissions uh, saving or uh, saving the indirect emissions that are happening because of actions here in the office. And the scope 3 emissions we are talking about indirect emissions from all upstream and downstream activities which are not included in scope 2. So, scope 2 we are only looking at indirect emissions resulting from the purchase of electricity, heating, cooling. So, all others which are upstream and downstream in the value chain of the company, the indirect emissions from that are going to be accounted in this scope 3. So, we have direct, indirect scope 2, indirect scope 3. So, these are the three emission scopes that we are going to cover in detail and we will look at examples of different businesses and what scope 1, 2 and 3 would mean for them. Now, before we will move on to that, I must tell you that this is still an emerging, emerging topic of discussion. There are a lot of times there are confusions and discussions over what needs to go in scope 1 or scope 2 or scope 2 or scope 3. So, this discussion is still happening, it is evolving which inventories should be covered as part of scope 2 and which inventories and activities should go as part of scope 3. Scope 1 often is clear because it is direct emission, we know what is causing direct emission here, but often scope 2 and 3 because they are indirect. So, we need to look at very keenly what are the uh, activities which need to go where. So, there will be a lot of example, but yet you have to understand that it is still an evolving field and would require more and more of discussion and clarity will come as the discussions go forward and this particular uh, protocol becomes more and more established with more and more inventories and examples and cases coming into, into picture and more and more companies starting to report the emissions. So, that is all in this particular lecture. Thank you very much for joining me and I will see you for the lecture 2 of this week tomorrow. Thank you and bye bye.